you know, it's in, most people at Palantir didn't get to do a lot of winning in high school. It's also fun for Palantir because we are winning. Uh, Alex, I've got to ask you before I lose you, the, actually the, the, the most common question that I get to ask you from the audience, I post on social media, you're coming on, is when will there be a direct-to-consumer or a, 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 I don't even know what we would call it, but a, but a publicly available version of AIP, and if that me, would ever me, happen. Let me tell you. Because they see okay. you as a leader in the space, the Palantir, not necessarily you as an individual. Whatever they see, that's I'm happy. Welcome back. In this video, we are discussing what Alex Karp just said yesterday at Palantir's AIPCon 3 product event demoing its AIP product in commercial settings. And in the interview beforehand with Bloomberg, I thought the interview were was a bit disrespectful at times, but otherwise good questions and excellent answers. You are seeing the tip of the iceberg when you are buying our product now. We've been working on these You things. can't buy it if you're a person off the great, street. Great. You are seeing the tip of the iceberg of our product development, and we are going to show more and more and more of what we have, and I think people, and I would also like, a lot of those people asking the question, by the way, are not academic. They are investors in Palantir, and they have supported us when we were down on the ropes, and those are the people that we are fighting for. One of those questions and answers you just witnessed was Palantir's consumer product. What is it? Why is it important? Likely share price impact? Is it even happening? Alex Karp did not give a direct answer, so I am here to break it down. As I mentioned, this was from AIPCon3, an interview beforehand, which has nothing to do with a consumer product. It's about Palantir's commercial business. Their only other business is government business. And these are both very high paying businesses because they result in very large contracts. So in this video, we're going to be diving into why would Palantir even want to sell? A consumer product and a reason for that if you look at the top 10 companies by market cap specifically the technology companies none of them are solely b2b now palantir is solely b2b at this point does that mean they couldn't be up here in the trillions of market cap without a b2b product no i'm not saying that and i certainly think their likelihood of a much higher market cap has increased with developing and deploying their aip product which has been extraordinarily successful so far but at this point a consumer product would not hurt and would skyrocket confidence from investors and wall street so what if i told you aip con was short for aip consumer or AIP for consumers. Now, this is a bit of a joke, but at the same time, it's not. So what is a Palantir consumer product? What would that actually look like? These are just some quick thoughts. If you're familiar with AIP, it makes so much sense. Personalizing news and information with the power of LLMs, providing an AI-powered personal assistant for scheduling productivity, health and wellness, using all of your health data in a way that respects privacy and combines it all in one unified environment, could be used for financials, other planning, and really anything you could think of. With the trust that Palantir has with personalized data, given that it's already doing many of these things on your behalf just within an organization, like within banks, Palantir is used within hospitals and other environments with respect to very personalized health information. And of course, it's used very much so in the commercial environment, being a personalized assistant, which we saw in yesterday's demo, as it operates in a mixed reality environment. So is this likely? And is this likely to happen very soon? Now, the answer is no, not in the near term, based on the answer we got from Alex Karp. But if you've been following Palantir for any period of time, you've seen a rapid increase in their talent, their resources, their momentum, all of those are building. Their talent in the last couple quarters has significantly increased in terms of applications they're getting from more and more qualified engineers. Their resources in the form of cash is exploding. Their momentum is off the charts in terms of interest in the product, interest in the company. And you saw Alex Karp speaking to a crowd full of of not engineers, not tech people, but people focused on transforming their business, representing their business in a conference where they're listening to Alex Karp lecture them on all sorts of things and they're fully engaged and it's really an experience that they want to be a part of. So all of that said, could Palantir pull off a consumer product? My confidence has never been higher.
But from a project perspective, you have to consider what this looks like. And this is what I really want investors to understand. You have, of course, the first thing you would think of is like, what are the cash flows we can actually generate from selling a consumer product? But at the same time, you have to subtract the costs of developing, selling, and maintaining that consumer product, as well as the opportunity cost losses from distraction from other product initiatives, right? Because Palantir would have to pull away engineers and talent from its other products. And that's a loss you have to consider unless they're able to rapidly increase hiring, which is another cost associated. So it's not free to develop these products. But the flip side to this is you're actually going to gain a lot from developing new technologies that are applicable elsewhere. So Palantir developed technologies applicable that they used in the government sector and were able to apply those and made that so compelling and profitable. Use those commercial technologies for a consumer product and use what they developed for the consumer product for something else we're not even thinking about yet. So the end result of that is the value of a consumer product. And if that equation is something valuable enough, Palantir will have to do it, right? Because at the end of the day, all of companies have to work on maximizing shareholder value over the long term. They're not going to jeopardize the business in the short term for something. But over the long term, if it makes financial sense, if it makes sense to the mission, they will do it. So what could the share price impact look like? Well, if Palantir is selling this for $20 a month, like you consider ChatGPT, Gemini, Perplexity, a lot of these AI services have established a $20 price point. I think Palantir could easily get $20, probably way much more than that. But if you consider $20 and 2 million users, which I just use Palantir's retail investor base, if ever one of Palantir's investors paid Palantir $20 a month for the product, that's half a billion dollars in ARR times Palantir's current price to sales ratio. That's $13 billion in market cap divided by its 2.5 billion shares outstanding. That's a $5 per share value, which is a 20% gain in today's market cap. And that's only selling to people that know about Palantir and are invested in Palantir. So obviously the opportunity here is just tremendous. And with that, I want to leave you with edits of Alex Karp describing their process for developing products. And I want you to think about what it looks like in the context of a potential consumer product. And let me know what you think about it in the comments. Basically, people built technologies where the person they're selling it to was de facto the host and the people selling it were de facto parasitic. You know, and that's what consumer internet basically is. You enjoy yourself, you enjoy yourself, they make all the money and you get slower and dumber uh, and you enjoy it. You know, so it's like, I'm getting slower, I'm getting dumber and every day I enjoy it more somehow. It's like hmm, the slowness, the slowness. This company and the products we built, leaving aside the kind of pro West thing that I'm very proud of, was built on the simple idea that our U.S. government clients primarily, although we have allies from almost every country in the world using our product, would get more value from the product than what they were paying for. It would not only make their institution work, but it would work better. So the first product we built was built to increase civil liberties and decrease terrorism at a cost that is very small for what we built. Now, if you fast forward to now, first we launched this product foundry, and then we built some things in the U.S. government and commercially, the ontology, which is now becoming famous, uh, other parts of our product. The whole reason these products were built years before anyone thought of large language models uh, was that we built a culture around, well, what should an enterprise, what ought to an enterprise want? If you took the enterprise and reduced it to what it ought to want to do with its software, what it ought to want to do with... Uh, its production, if it, what it ought to want to do on the battlefield, meaning, as uh, was mentioned, it, the battlefield doesn't even work unless it's software imagined and generated. And then in the commercial context, how would you deal with a very harsh competitive environment uh, where you, know, you have varying quality of assets, supply chains being disrupted, you have to make people uh, work in manufacturing as if they're from a different country in this country, um, you have to reduce your margin, you have to reimagine your supply chains, and what would the attributes of a software platform look like? And that, that's how we came up with Foundry and the ontology and all these things. It almost looks like magic, 
that they now exist, you have this incredible revolution. And then the revolution is really confusing. It's confusing because some large language models create value. Large language models do certain things well, they don't do other things well. You have PowerPoint production, which is a plight on our society. And I was like, get rid of the PowerPoint. That, you know, like, we at Palantir do things mostly for good reasons, but I, not anyone else at Palantir, also do things to humiliate people selling PowerPoints. Actually, this revolution is being driven by people in this room, and it is going to have an enormous impact on America, on the rest of the world. The other thing about this that's really cool is mostly, since a lot of these things people talk about weren't really true, you could wait, but what really is happening here is the early movers are gonna move much quicker and much faster. And those, by the way, we have a whole bunch of people in London who are here. So this is like America, England, all these places galvanizing, but the early movers are gonna have an enormous advantage over the people that wait, precisely because the, the incremental value is not incremental. And it's like, you, 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 the, every day you wait is a day where you can't catch up. That's the advantage of Silicon Valley over the rest of the, in America over the rest of the world. That's the advantage of Palantir, given that we built these things.